When we look at ryegrasses, there's many different species within that group. And so there's ones that are annual right through to ones that are perennial. And they all have different attributes that we have to choose uh, what we're looking for out of a grass to make sure that we select the right one that we're going to sow in our paddock. G'day, I'm Anthony Ledden, I'm the plant breeder for Valley Seeds. Ryegrass has three great attributes. Number one, it's fast to establish. Number two, it has easy grazing management. And number three, it has really high quality feed. Before we started experiencing a more variable climate, we just used one species in our pasture system and that really did the job for us. But now with a lot more climate change and variability occurring, we're finding out that these species aren't persisting as well anymore. So we need to have a lot more variability in our pasture species on our farm to make sure that we can manage that variable climate. And each species will do its own little job on your farm so that they can grow at different times of the year and persist for as long as, and be most productive uh, for as long as possible. As pastures become more and more important as a feed base on our farms, uh, they get more complex. So as you bring more different species into your pasture plan, that pasture plans get more complicated and you need to look for people that have the knowledge and the ability to give you information on how to manage those different species on your farms and how they interact with one another. So as a breeder, when I develop new varieties, what we try and do is spread uh, their production out more evenly over the year. And by doing that, um, that changes them from the older varieties that were around in the marketplace before, which are, are very tight in their production period. So having these new varieties, they come along with a management package where you have to make sure that you um, monitor the nutrition that you give these plants, you monitor the grazing management that they have, and you monitor how much moisture they have in the system as well, so that they've got enough moisture to persist and grow um, to their fullest potential. So an annual ryegrass is just what the name implies. It's, it grows only just for one year, and in that one year it produces most of its feed around the winter time. Uh, they're the fastest out of all the ryegrasses to get established, uh, and they usually flower around the end of October. So they do most of their growing uh, in that winter, early spring period, and then before the rains start running out um, in mid to late spring, they've done their job and they've really done a great job for you on your farm. Annuals and Italians do most of their growing over that winter period. Now, if you have a really late autumn break and you're starting to get into winter, you won't see much winter feed out of an annual or Italian until you get into spring. So keep that in mind if you have a late planting of an annual, annual or Italian ryegrass. So an Italian ryegrass is a little bit different to an annual ryegrass. They do most of their growing more later on in the season. So you tend to find that the Italian ryegrasses usually head around the mid to the end of November. And they are much more densely tillered and finer leaved than what you tend to find in a annual ryegrass. So you, you see in those varieties that they're more suited to making hay out of or um, silage than what an annual ryegrass be because they have um, better quality forage for livestock. If you had an early spring finish, which is what the predictions they are making with a lot of climate change, an annual ryegrass would be more suitable than an Italian ryegrass. The reason being is that uh, the annuals usually flower around the end of October and so by that stage they've done most of their growing and if things dry out after that it's okay. Uh, and Italian ryegrass, they flower around the end of November and in most environments we're running out of moisture by the end of, uh, of November. But um, an Italian, if you do have a late end to the season like we are this year, you can take advantage of that with an Italian ryegrass by continuing to grow and produce uh, good quality forage. A big difference between an annual and Italian ryegrass is that an Italian ryegrass can grow into their second year, whereas an annual ryegrass can't. So a hybrid ryegrass is actually a cross between an Italian and a perennial ryegrass. And where would I use a hybrid ryegrass? In situations where you're looking to over sow old perennial pastures that are starting to um, have gaps come in them as plants start to die off. So hybrids are really good at filling those gaps and creating some winter feed um, and extending the life out of a, an older perennial pasture. A perennial ryegrass is a species that can last around three to 10 years. So perennial ryegrass also has a finer leaf and is more densely tillered, so can withstand heavier grazing than the annual and Italians. Although the winter dry matter production is less than those species of ryegrass, it actually has the same spring dry matter yield and 
there also is a really large range of heading dates, so you have large choice when it comes to finding a variety that suits your season length and rainfall. Perennial ryegrass has been around for a long time, so there's been a lot of research done on the species, and so that's helped us develop a management package that helps us get the most out of perennial ryegrass from a yield point of view, and helps us get perennial ryegrass to persist for as long as possible. In all the species that we've talked about in ryegrass, the annuals right through to the perennials, within them you have two different groups, and they're known as diploids and tetraploids. What are diploids and tetraploids? Basically diploids are plants that are smaller uh, and tetraploids are plants that are slightly larger. Now if we were comparing the two um, in the field, diploids would look more finer leafed, uh, would be more densely tillered uh, and they tolerate more harder grazing than what you tend to find with tetraploids that are less densely tillered. They have larger leaves uh, but they have a higher what we call water soluble carbohydrate levels so they have higher sugars in them. And so what does that mean? That means that those sugars can be taken advantage of um, from an animal grazing preference point of view. So we find that animals will choose to graze tetraploids before they graze the diploids. And also um, in making silage, uh, tetraploids work really well in that scenario with the higher levels of sugar in them. So there's different management that's needed for diploids and tetraploids. So under dry conditions, diploids seem to be able to tolerate that better. They can tolerate harder grazing and also more lax grazing. You can allow diploids to grow a lot taller and they won't lodge. Uh, whereas the tetraploids, because they have a heavier leaf on them, uh, if you graze them down too low, then it's harder for a tetraploid to recover from that uh, harder grazing. And also if you let the tetraploids grow too tall, uh, because of their heavier leaf, they tend to lodge and fall over more and that that's, grass is wasted when you allow stock in. They'll stamp on top of it uh, while they're grazing. So it's important that you take that into account from a management point of view. And also, um, as they get more closer to the end of their lives, when they become more reproductive, things change with a diploid and tetraploid. So because tetraploids have a larger seed than what diploids do, uh, they tend to lose their quality more rapidly at flowering uh, or when they're producing their seed heads. And what happens is, is that the seed is heavier in a tetraploid seed head. So to be able to hold that seed head up more upright, uh, the stem has to have more fibre in the stem to be able to hold it up. And by doing that, um, you start to lose quality more rapidly in the tetraploids when they're going reproductive when compared to a diploid variety. Take home message for today is to make sure you have plenty of diversity on your farm. So don't put all your eggs into one basket. If you just have one species or one variety all over your farm, you're bound for failure. So there is no silver bullet out there. There's no perfect variety. Each variety has its own strengths and weaknesses and you have to work with those strengths and you have to understand the weaknesses so that you don't have problems with them in your pastures in the future. And the, the last thing that you need to remember is that with climate change and the variable climates that we're experiencing, we can grow more pasture grass. We just have to understand our grasses and species that we grow in our pastures more. And so that means you, you have to show more importance towards them. Have that pasture plan. Make sure you create one with your agronomist and make sure that you refer to it at every stage. You can use it to your best of your abilities to grow the most pastures and to get the species on your farms to persist for as long as possible. Thank you for viewing this video, produced as part of the Valley Seeds 2020 Open Day Series. For assistance preparing a pasture plan or general pasture advice, speak to our friendly Valley Seeds team. Call 1800 226 905 or email info at valleyseeds.com. And for information any time of the day or night, visit our website at valleyseeds.com.